When Amin announced that we should leave, first of all, it was a disbelief for a few days to say, is this guy joking? Are you me? Asians were a part of a parcel of the of Uganda, but uh, last 90 days uh, was quite horrific. I was twice I was held at a gunpoint because they wanted the car that we were in, and it was fortunate that we managed to get away from it. Um, I had to do about seven or eight trips in the last 90 days to get our passports etc. ready. Normally at that time, of any person of my age wouldn't have gone through that because their parents or elder brothers would have done it. And in my case, I had to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. And it wasn't really a pleasant experience. My father lost his eyesight when I was about 13, so he became blind. And from 13 onwards, most of the official work, etc., you know, it was given to me, so, and I traveled back home, told the family. Uh, we packed up everything one Sunday evening and moved out of our town, traveled to Lugazi and we stood, stayed there for three or four days. From there on, we just trying to time it with other families to get their tickets, etc. sorted out. And on the last day we left, caught a coach from Kampala to Entebbe, and you were under army escort to make sure that you don't get hassled. All the other trips that we've done, to and fro, by that time, the army, the military police, or the police themselves would stop you anywhere. Whatever you had, they would take it from you. So if you had a watch they liked, they would take it from you. And our, me and my uncle did that regularly. So what we had was a booth full of clothes, no suitcase. And the reason being is that you can pick up whatever you want, please yourself. And quite often we used to put a lot of regs in there as well, just to make it look full. And quite often they just stopped taking whatever they wanted. If they felt like they didn't have enough or we didn't have enough to offer them, and they would just slap you around the face and kick you or something for not providing them with everything that other agents were providing. And uh, on the last few days before we left, we'd moved up to Lugaz, which is only 28 miles from Kampala. So whenever we got the exit clearance and the tickets, we would be on the plane straight away and out. Um, so there was eight of us with few other family friends who we were to travel with. We would have left about four or five weeks early, but we wanted to make sure two elderly couples who were family friends um, got their exit as well. So we want to make sure that they were, were on their uh, plane to India. My uncle was on the plane to Canada and then we got on our plane to the UK. It was a joy when they turned around and said that we have cleared Ugandan airspace. And that's the only time that we, I, I particularly relaxed. We were lucky enough to be able to get our exit trust, you know, tickets, etc. sorted out. But there were dozens and dozens of people, families, who didn't have any means or ability to get their passports or things sorted out. And I know that a lot of community elders got together and sponsored their exit. And when by, what I mean by sponsored is they turn around and say, we've got a family here, they've got a British passport, they can get onto, onto a plane and we need to find five tickets for them. And all the businessmen would chip in and give them more money. Two of them, the family got out, but they never saw their husband ever. Um, one, we realized that uh, the army was after them and he had to go up country, and lived a very simple life in some village for good two or three years before he emerged and his family assumed that he was dead. Um, but the two people who left behind, we don't know what happened to them. The family has arrived in UK and uh, obviously Red Cross did a search for him, but they never found what happened to the family. Uh, next morning we landed at uh, Stansted Airport. Um, and because my dad was blind, we waited for everybody to clear. So when I was walking up with him, we, we could walk, he was blind, but 
we came up to the doorstep at Stansted Airport and we stood there looking at the landing, you know, the, all the people who had landed and the, and the terminal, and we could see through the terminal, it was only 7.30 in the morning. And uh, I remember one of the crew telling me, are you okay? I said, yes. And I was, had a smile and he looked at me and said, 24 hours earlier, that would all have been a black man doing all the cleaning. Whereas 24 hours, you could turn, turn around and see all the cleaners, etc. The tables turned completely. And, uh, and that's, uh, once, once we landed, we had to, obviously my sister had a little scar on a, a little uh, wound on her knee. So that's why we were retained at the airport. And I was actually taken to, me and my sister were, went to Bishop Stott for the General Hospital, where they wanted to keep her to make sure that she's not infected. So she was kept there and I had to stay with her. So we were there for about six days. And in that six days, I got bored after day one. So there's a lady called Mrs. Hughes who came to see me from Red Cross. And I said, look, I'm getting bored. Anything I can do at the airport, let me come. So two days, two hours or three hours a day, I used to go to the airport, stands at the airport. And rather than just hanging around, I started helping the volunteers who were tying up cases and you know, broken suitcases. And it was quite strange that I was on the other side of the barriers as people were coming in. And a lot of people who I'd met two or three days early in Kampala, and particularly my school friends and people from Soroti were walking past it. They were very curious to see me on the other side, saying, what the hell are you doing there? The first came, memory of camp was very interesting. Uh, interesting in a sense that my family arrived here a week before me. I was held back at, the, at Stansted Airport to allow my sister medical treatment and a week later we joined. So I was put onto a train at uh, one of the stations in London, I can't remember which one, and uh, I was told that people would be waiting for you at Honiton station. But when we got to Honiton about 4.30 or 5 o'clock, they had taken trouble to station one person every 10 yards to make sure that all the carriages were covered and that if they saw me, they would knock on the window. <laughs> And they panicked because they couldn't see me in any of the carriages because I was standing by the door to, about to disembark. And uh, when I came out, friends and people from the camp would come out to look out for me, all the volunteers. It was nice to see all the people. It was a good welcome. If nobody turned up at the station, it would have been a bit, bit of a panic. A group of friends that we developed, or that I developed at the time, were the volunteers. They were CSV volunteers, community service volunteers. And they were more or less similar age. 1920 and one guy called Dick Nash who came there, he had a Morris Minor and particularly we became good friends so we'd be out watching Exeter City play. Sports is one thing that brings a lot of different cultures and communities together uh, regardless of colour, creed, it depends on ability and it was quite interesting that when I got here there was two football was already set up and uh, volleyball so somebody offered a lot of hockey sticks so we started a hockey team as well and uh, we had csv volunteers and admin people who are quite proactive in in trying to help you to develop uh, links develop games so we had a gym on on site it was an old gym which we, quite a few of us went in there cleared it out and used it so we had indoor football we used to play and then once we got a good enough team we went to play outside I remember beating some Exmouth College 9-2 when we, when we first started. Within the first 10 minutes, we were losing 2-0. And then uh, we told everybody to forget about all the warm clothing you were wearing. Take it off, keep on running, and they'll keep you warm. Uh, we ended up winning that, uh, that game. Uh, sports was important, yes, because it helped us to meet a lot of local people at the time, um, which we thought that may last a few more months but come January it was announced that uh, within a week all those who were left apart from a handful of families were, were going to be located locally that we were able to move out and move to Fallingworth. We were transferred to Fallingworth. So we lost a lot of contacts in that case but it was one good way of actually meeting not only the local people but also people who were interested in football and being in my situation that I came across um, doing all the admin work, etc., 
I used to pop it for a couple of hours into the admin office every day, particularly to the translations and particularly building a confidence with older generations saying, you know, they would ask you questions saying, I've, I've been nominated this place. What is it like? In terms of food, I was, it was my least bother. I'll be honest with you, because in the last 90 days, we'd realized that surviving is far more important than, than eating well. I know there was a lot of kufafal when we first started it. People were saying, we did Indian food. And the camp administrators were very good, very, very uh, perceptive in that way. Is they got people involved. They were Indian cooks. They got to do the cooking. It did quite a lot because it humbled you to see how many people went way out to help you. And uh, particularly people who we never knew, who turned up, who came up and said, I was here, you know, three, four months ago, making beds, you know, cleaning the huts, because you could realize these huts and the camp was closed for almost two years. So they had to clear out all the cobwebs and everything, make everything work, make everything habitable. All those volunteers, all those unpaid people who spent hours and hours helping us out, community service volunteers were brilliant. Um, C WRVS ladies were, were, were brilliant. Uh, they were always on the ball. You know, if they saw you walking around without a jacket, you know, they would call you in and say, would you like a jacket? And if they couldn't find the one that fitted you, I'm sure within a couple of days they'd find something that fitted you. Um, and I think that momentous effort that they did between October and, and first week in November, when most of the Asians had arrived, and you would realize there's a condensed six weeks period and 28,000 people arriving. Um, so everything did a, did a brilliant job. Um, and all I would say on behalf of all the Uganda nations is uh, thank you. I left camp in 1970, so I would be just over 18, coming to 18th birthday. Um, 18th birthday would have been June, and I left in March. Honiton, we left in January 73, and we were transferred by a wire train. Uh, half a dozen of us helped the rest of the baggage crew to bag all the stuff, put it on the trucks at Honiton camp, offload it at, at the railway station and put it on the train. And uh, the journey itself, I remember very well because there was all the food and drinks, etc., on the camp, on the train. And uh, apart from a few girls who join us, the eight or nine of us volunteers, and some other CSV volunteers who traveled with us, we were ferrying food up and down. And obviously, once we got to Market Raisin, they had volunteers that offload stuff for us. This is in Lincolnshire where we got transferred to. Um, leaving camp was a bit sad, but we had to move on. We knew that uh, we were going to go to a better place. Um, leaving camp altogether, I, we left in May, March 73, and by that time I had secured a place in Hall Green College in Birmingham to go and do my all levels. Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen that year because of all the transfers and transits, etc. So I had to wait for the following years to do my all levels. In the meantime, I did a couple other courses and, uh, and we settled in Birmingham. Uh, from there on, we just looked at all the sports, everything that we could do. Uh, there was a large community of Asians there, particularly Hindus. And not only that, but a lot of people from that my father knew had a shared history in Kenya were actually in Birmingham. So when we settled down, we would get a knock on the door and people would turn up as, and ask for my dad's name and say, come in. And then you suddenly realize that these two guys are meeting after 50 or 60 odd years. Academically, it was good because we started, or I started all levels, uh, got through that quite easily, and then A levels and a, and a degree at Warwick. Um, Family-wise, it was good. It was a struggle. It was a struggle in a sense that uh, obviously my sisters were working. I was a student, uh, so 
but we managed. The first three, four years were difficult. But one of the things I thoroughly enjoyed at the time, and I'd found out in, when I was in Uganda, that uh, a lot of band called Santana and Jimi Hendrix. So first thing I did in, when I got to Birmingham was go to a, a concert. When I joined Holguin College, there's a, another long-haired layabout who turned around and says, oh, you interested in this? I got two tickets for it. We, pound, pound, we paid £2.50 to go and see Frank Zappa. Pound. The experience of camp taught a lot of people a lot of things, and in particular, things like doing good for the community. I know a lot of Ugandan Asians who have done well in terms of prosperity and everything, but then I know far more Ugandan Asians who's done well for the community. Um, all the friends I've known from school, from Uganda, from my town, they've held a lot of community positions. They contribute a lot of the community. Not all of us go for accolade, are you with me? Um, there are a lot of friends who's donated, lots of people who came, particularly businessmen who came in the 70s, who through, when they left, left camp, they had their old business partners who were in Uganda, were in this country. So together they had the skills, but no capital. But once they got the capital, and they employed their skills, or deployed their skills, and started making money. One of the very first things they did, they donated a lot of money to temples, to community centers. Having lost a lot of things in your life, um, people realized that you could contribute to a community. Um, and in our town, temples opened their doors, mosques the same if you're Muslim, Gurdwara the same if you're Sikh, that anything you wanted, you could go in there and say, I want to, you know, I want money for, to buy two tickets for my family or three tickets. They would chop up, they would chip in and, and find out something for you. And that humbling effect, when you go through it, um, it really transforms you.